All right. I'll go ahead and share my screen and look at that. Yeah. So um, you ready, Dr. Felinov and Chris? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Ambach, and today we have a very exciting topic, and we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Mona Velinov, uh, joining us today. Um, also joining us is Dr. Chris Rogers. Uh, you know, Dr. Rogers is the founder of San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group, our practice. Um, I joined Dr. Rogers about four or five years ago um, from a regenerative practice in LA. Uh, we both conduct research, we publish clinical trials, we both teach at several con conferences and courses, and we lecture at uh, these national conferences, helping to lead and move the field of regen regenerative medicine and orthobiologics forward. There's also two other physicians that uh, join us in our practice, Dr. Ed Evangelista and Dr. Muriel Diaz. And together, we, uh, we provide the most comprehensive regenerative orthobiologic treatments to San Diegans and people from all over the country. Dr. Mona Velinov is a board-certified family physician for over 20 years. Um, thank you for joining us today. She is also a board-certified um, physician in integrative medicine and certified in functional medicine. Um, and her latest area of study and interest is in longevity medicine. Um, uh, mostly as a discipline to promote ongoing optimization of lifestyle and to keep people healthy and active throughout their lifetime. So today she will be talking about a whole body approach to joint inflammation. We are very lucky to have her this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Velinov. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris, <laughs> for the invitation. And I'm excited to share this area, which is really a passion of mine. Um, so we're going to talk about a systems way of approaching joint health. And what that means is really thinking of the body as a system working together. And this goes from down to the cellular level, all the way up to the organs, and then the organ systems working together. And so when we look at that, and we think about these multiple areas of health, we can appreciate their interconnectedness, and we can work in a conjunctive way to bring everything together. So um, in functional medicine, um, there are some kind of guidelines that we use to help us break down how do we think about these issues. And so, you know, traditionally, when you go to the doctor, if you have a, a stomach problem, a GI problem, you see a gastroenterologist. If you have a heart issue, you see a cardiologist. Um, and so on with all the subspecialties. And really, we think about those as the leaves of the tree. And if we take that down, you think, okay, well, these are all organ systems. And when we have those organs affected, they've come from signs and symptoms that you've presented with. You have some chest pain, you have some stomach issues, and then that leads to us to say, well, that means that there are some imbalances in that system, and there is a reason that they're going on. And, and then as we get into that reasoning, we're really looking for the root causes. And that brings you down to these root areas and saying, okay, well, you know, what's happening with your nutrition? What, what, what kind of stresses do you have day to day? What are your relationships like? Who do you live with at home? What are some of the things that could be provoking those symptoms that are happening? What kind of exercise and movement do you do? What kind of sleep do you have? And what's the quality of your sleep? And then also just sort of, you know, how do we perceive our health from the mental aspect, the spiritual aspect and the emotional aspects of what's going on at that period of our lives? Combining that with genetics, so looking at genetic predispositions, do you have something from your genetics that might predispose that gene to be expressed, and that leading into symptoms. So it's a lot really working on the root causes and understanding what are these things that are leading to your health imbalance. And we organize this into what we call the matrix. So we look and say, okay, well, are there um, antecedents, which are usually genetic predispositions, something that triggered, maybe you had a big stressful event, and after that, you know, your joints never felt the same or your energy was never the same. We look at what are the things that are mediating that and perpetuating that condition in you. Do you not get enough sleep? Do you have a lot of stress in your life that's overwhelming? What are the things that are allowing this condition and imbalance to continue on? And then organizing into this systems way, which we'll go through on some separate slides of what these actually mean. And our focus really to start with, with most patients and um, is to really figure out the lifestyle factors that we can optimize. So you can see it's a really personalized approach. And we think about 
the gut, your hormones, your immune system, your cardiovascular health, metabolic health, your blood sugar balances, detoxification, and mitochondria. And so um, the gut. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Chris, can you see Dr. Velenov's slide? No, I think what you need to do, doctor, is hit play at the top. And then that way we might be able to see your slides. Yeah, because we're not seeing it advancing. Oh, hang on a sec. Yep. Let's see. Oh, is it stuck on the first one? Yeah, it's stuck on the first one. It is. So I have your slides. Uh, I'm going to share my screen if you if you are okay. Yeah. Uh, you can stop your share and I can share my screen and we can um, <laughs> and just tell me uh, next slide when you're ready. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. Perfect. All right. And then let's go to the next one. So you probably, maybe you didn't see this. No, we didn't see this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I was mentioning about sort of having these subspecialties um, where you have a diagnosis and then that leads into signs and symptoms. And that would lead into thinking of core imbalances and then looking at the root causes of those core imbalances down here. And then understanding if you have a genetic predisposition that that core imbalance may turn on that gene leading into your signs and symptoms, which lead you into these organ um, dysfunctions. So next slide, please, Mary. And so this is how we organize the information and looking to say, well, what was your predisposition from a genetic standpoint? Was there a triggering event, like I was mentioning, a stress um, or something else causing this? And then what is perpetuating the imbalance from happening? And then we organize that information into these different systems to move forward and figuring out how do we help you with the lifestyle modification to rebalance. Next slide, please. So the comprehensive evaluation looks at the gut, the hormones, immune system, cardiovascular, metabolic, detoxification, and the mitochondria. And we'll go through kind of a highlight of each of these areas. Next slide, please. So your gut is really turning out to be quite a critical component of your health. <laughs> if, you, if you see probably headlines kind of from the New York Times and other publications, you've probably seen a lot of stuff about the gut microbiome. And the research just continues to kind of go and go and go into the overreaching aspects of the gut microbiome. Um, we're also now starting to appreciate the oral microbiome. How is, what are the bacteria here that are starting off for your health um, to the rest of your body and the rest of your gut as well? Um, we understand that the gut and the immune system are intricately connected. So if your gut bacteria are off, they may signal certain things to your immune system, and that may trigger different types of inflammation. And we'll talk about how that connects to joint health. There are some publications looking into this as well. The gut-brain connection also very well established from a number of different factors, again, from the microbiome feeding up through the vagus nerve, which is a big nerve running from your gut to your brain, and vice versa, the vagus nerve running down into your gut, the vagus nerve being the nerve that really regulates your parasympathetic nervous system. That's your rest and digest component that's opposite from the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. And so having a good balance with the vagus nerve helps us to regulate our digestion and helps us to regulate a good healthy microbiome. So there's that gut brain connection. We'll talk about how the gut is now connecting to, the, to joint health as well and lots of research looking at this. And then testing and treatments to improve gut and optimize your microbiome are now becoming more and more available where we can help you really personalize what your gut bacteria look like because all of us are different. We eat different foods. We kind of you know, help certain bacteria foster and others may not be quite as high as we'd like it to be. Next slide, please. So hormones um, are also really important. So we look at the full spectrum of hormones. So your thyroid, from your thyroid gland, insulin levels, sex hormones, and um, as well as cortisol and looking at all the factors with that. Hormones work as a symphony. So they all work together. One signaling from the hypothalamus to the pituitary in your brain down to the specific organ systems. And those organ systems are also talking to one another. So if your adrenal gland is putting out a lot more cortisol, your thyroid responds by raising up how much thyroid hormone because your body is getting a signal it's under stress and it needs to kind of keep going. But optimizing these areas of hormones will help a lot with brain function, mood, energy, and as well as your joint health. Um, and the other part that's really critical too is how do you break those hormones down? So when we take, when our hormones are being uh, kind of cleared out from the body, they run through the liver, then they're usually metabolized through the urine and through the gut. 
There are certain factors genetically that can make you a little less prone to breaking those hormones down efficiently. And we can use foods and supplementation to really help that process along because it's an important factor. Also, we look at your gut and make sure that your gut is optimized and healthy to clear those hormones out. Next slide, please. Immune system, we've had a lot of discussion about this over the last two years, especially um, how important immune health is for long-term health. This is a big area also in aging research where we look at what we call inflammaging, where as, as we get older, we have the, this chronic inflammation in our immune system, we really cannot tolerate or handle a lot of things that we may be exposed to. So you know, things that we look at are from autoimmune disease to the different types of infections, to um, other dysregulations of our immune system from viruses that we may carry along. So boosting your immune system to stay strong and tolerant throughout your lifetime is also a big part of what we're looking at. And again, that gut immune connection can be, um, can be an important factor. And when those areas are out of balance, we'll tend towards inflammaging and we'll tend towards increasing the amount of cytokines, which are those chemical signals that tell the body, okay, we're out of, you know, we're out of balance. The immune system is signaling for extra help. And some of those cytokines can be directed towards our joints and cause inflammation in our joints as well. Next slide, please. So cardiovascular health, another uh, component that we look at from the matrix and the understanding of systems biology, you know, this is the major risk factor for most, for men and women throughout the world and really throughout the US is still the number one risk factor is heart disease. Um, inflammation is a very big part of heart disease. So it's looking at what are all the inflammatory particles that are <laughs> combined to increase our risk or what put us at risk for issues with our heart. So we look at not only your cholesterol, we look at your particle size of cholesterol, and then we're also looking at inflammatory markers that are related to cardiovascular risk. You can now even have um, vascular aging done where we can look at and see how are you doing like for your carotid arteries? Are they very healthy or are you having some um, aging of your carotid arteries to give us an idea of what we need to work on for cardiovascular health. Um, fitness, cardiac fitness is really important. So um, strength training is important as well for lots of different reasons, but having a good amount of regular exercise to keep your cardiac fitness is a, is a key component for cutting your risk for cardiovascular uh, disease. Next slide, please. Metabolic health. Um, kind of goes along with cardiac health, but also has a factor of um, different areas in, in, the, um, in the body as well. So optimizing your glucose, your insulin, your diet, even the timing of when you eat can be a factor for a lot of people as far as how their blood sugar responds. Um, and then the quality of the food that you're taking in. If you're gearing towards a higher fiber diet, less sugar, um, low glycemic, so less even some of the foods that can cause a bigger sugar response will help you keep your glucose under control. A lot of times we have patients wearing a continuous glucose monitor who are people who are not diabetic, but we just want to see what happens when you eat these foods that you have every day. Everyone is different. Sometimes a sweet potato will cause a patient's blood sugar to go very high. Others don't have any response at all. So in this way, we can really personalize what you're eating every day to keep that blood sugar much more stable. Next slide, please. Detoxification refers to the um, fact of how we clear things from our body. So anything that we're exposed to every day, the liver, the lymphatics, the kidneys, and the gut are really, and the skin are the real ones that do all the work of clearing those things out. So that's everything we eat, the air that we're exposed to, the water that we drink, the things that we put on our skin from lotions, shampoos, makeup, everything needs to be cleared out. And this is the job of the detoxification pathways. Another you know, important part of keeping us healthy and balanced throughout our lifetime. Next slide, please. And then the mitochondria, which is kind of my personal favorite <laughs> is the mitochondria because they're really little batteries of bacteria that have come into our own cells. They're pretty amazing, very important for, again, long-term health. They're the ones making all of your energy through the day. They take your food and turn it through a chemical process you might remember called the Krebs cycle. And that at the end, you're getting ATP that gets recycled and that keeps our energy up. Mitochondria tend to go down 
through our lifetime as we get older. So people who have fatigue, one problem could be that their mitochondria are not optimized. Um, you do need a lot of micronutrients to keep the Krebs cycle going. So you need magnesium and B vitamins um, and glutathione, which is an antioxidant to help these mitochondria function. But little things, exercising, like we talked about for cardiovascular exercise, probably the best thing you can do for your overall health. Um, it's fantastic for mitochondria. And then there are other things called hermetic stresses, where you put a little bit of extra stress to your body. So this could be getting in a sauna or a hot tub on a regular basis or submerging yourself to cold. You've probably seen some things around cold therapies and cold plunges. Those types of things turn on heat shock proteins, which is a pathway for us to increase the number of mitochondria in our body. Um, so there's there are some you know, little things you can tweak into your week to week to help you optimize your mitochondria as well. Next slide. Intermittent fasting too, I believe is another area that has been a lot of research around showing this. Yes. Intermittent fasting also has a lot of other components just with autophagy, which is, you know, right, clearing out senescent cells. So those cells that once they've kind of reached their end of their lifetime and need to be cleaned out, yeah. fasting can help with that a lot too. So, yeah. Uh, this is just a slide to show a little bit about the mitochondria. So you have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. It really does work as a battery. You have a kind of this electron transport chain that moves electrons through here. And as a result, you'll get the ATP production. So um, pretty fascinating that we have these inside of all of our cells. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that can help with a framework of understanding how do we think about these problems of inflammation, inflammation um, is the cell danger response, which is Dr. Navio from UCSD put together this really well thought out program of how do we think about these things and what are the levels of um, inflammation that we go through. So he described sort of these three stages where you have cell danger response one, then two, then three. And the idea is that each of these, you have a little bit of a different response. And the and normally what you should do is you go through the inflammatory process, but you have resolution of the inflammation. Um, and what and where the issue becomes, you know, um, less conducive is if you're stuck in an inflammatory uh, period or, or cycle, and you're not really moving through to the resolution. So our whole um, you know, job when we're looking at this is to say, where are you with the inflammation? How much inflammation are we dealing with? And how do we move you through into resolution and then keep you in a place where anytime you get an acute inflammation, if you get a cold or you get you twisted your ankle, that that actually heals and resolves itself, that you're not stuck with this, another problem on the, on the list of what's been going on for your health. Next slide, please. So he um, has written a number of papers just sort of uh, showing this as a new model for understanding chronic disease and how to treat it. Next slide, please. And so here's sort of how he broke it down. And I like this as a really simple way of thinking about this is, Here's your you know, affected tissue or organs, you get a stress or an injury, you go to cell danger response one, then two, then three should be the healing cycle. But if you don't get out of that healing cycle, then you can kind of get stuck in one of these illness categories um, instead of getting to recovery. And hormetic stress we talked about, like the sauna or the cold, you kind of go through a little bit of, a, it is a stress, but it's a stress that actually makes you stronger. So it should be a short, acute stress you resolve from it, you actually kind of improve your strength and your and you have recovery as well. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit more kind of bringing in different things that we get exposed to. So you may have, um, you know, the, the healthy cycle as you move through this the cell danger response levels and then you get back to wakeful activity and everything is getting healed. When we don't, um, when we don't sleep well, when we don't have the macronutrients, when we have other things that are out of balance, you may get stuck into one of these areas where you're starting to get, you know, autoimmune conditions, chronic pain, some psychiatric type of symptoms that can be related to an inflammatory process going on, and you're not moving into the balance of the healing. And so this, you know, again, is another diagram to sort of framework. How do we think about getting you healed and resolving the issue that's going on? Next slide, please. So Hippocrates has, uh, said all disease begins in the gut. We're starting to really realize <laughs> all of these things. Next slide. 
Um, and these are some papers just talking about some of the areas. So we talked a little bit about the oral microbiome. Uh, P. gingivalis is a, is a pathogen, is an organism that lives, can live in our, in our mouth. And it has been linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's been linked to cardiovascular disease. And um, it has also been linked to rheumatoid arthritis. Next slide, please. So this was a diagram that they had from this paper, just talking about this organism and how it is also can be linked to diabetes, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer. Uh, it may be linked to different types of cancers. NAFLD is, um, is a uh, liver condition where you have a fatty liver and Alzheimer's dementia. So this microbe, when it is overgrowing in your mouth, will send out sort of different cytokines and now you have these inflammatory pathways, you get an immune response and that immune response is, is causing inflammation in those different organ systems. There are now tests you can do. Um, I use a, a couple of different uh, oral tests that are saliva tests that actually can sequence what type of bacteria you have in your mouth. They look for those top pathogens and then we put, do a program to really help people resolve that pathogen and clear them out because these also can cause um, uh, gum destruction and inflammation, gingivitis as well. Next slide. Um, this is talking a little bit about aging and the gut microbiome. So some of the insights that we understand that can happen as we go through life. Next slide, please. So this is looking at when we have uh, gut dysbiosis or imbalance of the gut um, can lead into changes of our diversity. And now you're starting to have what we call leaky gut, where you have this opening of the pathway between the gut lumen inside of your, of your body and the bloodstream, and you can have certain things pass through. The main thing we, that has been honed in on is something called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which is the coating on, outside of bacteria. When that passes through that gut lining into the bloodstream, now you have a reason to have systemic response because the immune system says, no, 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 this is a foreign body. We need to mount an immune response. And that Im immune response and inflammation can be many different places. And we'll see how a lot of these can be in joint health, but it can also be in other places as well. Um, that gut permeability causes a decrease in gut motility. Your metabolism can be affected when your gut is out of balance. You have increased amount of inflammation, increased issues with disease uh, predisposition and, and um, needing to have different doses sometimes even of, the, of your medications. This can all lead into host senescence or aging. So senescent cells, we had mentioned kind of briefly where those are those cells that are aging and they need to be cleared out. Having get to gut dysbiosis can kind of induce more of that aging um, pathway for the cells. And that will lead into this increase across the board of many different conditions from the brain to the gut, to um, your blood vessels and increasing stress to the body. Next slide, please. So we have over 3 million genes just in the colon. So when we're talking about the gut microbiome here, we're really only talking about the large intestine. Small intestine is thought to be relatively sterile, although that's probably, there are a few organisms like archaea, which are a little different than the regular bacteria that do reside in the small intestine. You know, I think we'll learn more about what the microbiome is of the small intestine. Um, but at this time, we're really focused more on the, on the colon and understanding that. Um, they interact with our cells in direct activity. They are involved in health and disease, as we've talked about. You do have multiple different microbiomes. So, you know, we have a skin microbiome. We have a nasal microbiome. Uh, we talked a little bit about the oral microbiome. There's a vaginal microbiome. All of these areas have their own sort of subset of what the organisms are that are dominant and that actually help you to maintain the right pH, the right kind of factors to allow for proper function. Excellent. Dr. Mona, in the past few years, we've learned in orthopedics that the disc, the intervertebral disc, the little cushion between your bones and your spine, we presume to be a sterile environment. Turns out not to be true. It has its own microbiome, which has been shown when it's not the right balance of bacteria in your disc can be associated with scoliosis, disc degeneration, all these other diseases that we, for years, assumed was just traumatic, you know, wear and tear. Now we're learning that what you're talking about here also applies to the disc, which that's right. New data. Yep. Yeah, isn't that incredible? It's just incredible. Shocked so. me when I learned that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, even, I it skipped a slide, so I went back to your um, 
So the, the slide prior. I see. Oh, I think this is still, this is fine. Still yeah. the gut, yeah. Yeah, still the gut. Um, even the brain we thought was, you know, sterile. And right. yeah. Microbiome community there too. So, um, so it, it the story continues to become more and more interesting. Um, so you have a, a very sophisticated set of signaling that goes from the mouth down through the gut to really signal everything that's going to happen with your digestion and absorption of all your nutrients, which you need for all the other systems to work as well. Um, we also have this GULT, which is gut-associated lymphoid tissue, part of that immune system, really surveying because every time you eat is an opportunity for an infection to be introduced into your body. Your immune system is there to respond to that. Um, and that GULT also you know, sends out signals systemically as well. We talked about the gut and brain connection and those tight junctions, which are important to avoid leaky gut and um, keep that lip lipopolysaccharide from getting into the rest of the system. Next slide, please, Mary. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. So the gut microbiome and host health, this is looking at a new kind of clinical frontier of understanding how this all works together. Next slide, please. Um, and this was just a nice um, understanding of how a healthy gut with those nice tight junctions. So you can see the cells are really lined up to keep things that you've been exposed to inside the gut lumen, and then it doesn't get through. When you have this uh, gut that's aging or dysbiotic or out of balance, um, you get this opening exactly, and then you're getting things that are coming through. When those come through, they indicate the immune system responds and starts to activate cells to respond and cytokines to come through. And then this can be signaling that can go through the vagus nerve to the brain and cause issues. But again, you know, this can be systemic. It can go anywhere in the body that can cause some inflammatory response. Next slide, please. Again, kind of another um, association with how a healthy intestine is important to keep us healthy over our lifetime and how uh, a senescent intestine or uh, dysbiotic and this doesn't have to be just when we get older. You know, if you've traveled and then you had traveler's diarrhea or you had, you know, different symptoms after traveling, we can pick up parasites. We can pick up all kinds of things that may be leading into this intestinal barrier dysfunction and setting us up for problems with our health overall. Next slide. So this paper looking at can osteoarthritis actually start in the gut? What is the gut joint axis? Next slide. So here they were looking at that there are certain types of bacteria that they're even honing in on to say that if these are a little bit out of balance, these different families of bacteria, that these can also induce higher amounts of cytokine and inflammation, and that that can be contributing to osteoarthritis. So they're even you know looking at should we be honing in on certain probiotics to give patients to help reset the gut in order to improve joint health overall. Next slide. Um, this is another one just looking at gut permeability and osteoarthritis. So we talked about that leaky gut and those opening of tight junctions. Next slide, please. So here they have a nice graph where they say, okay, well, you know, what you're eating in your diet will affect your weight. But we're, you know, looking at what you eat in your diet can also interact with your microbiome, which will cause some changes in your weight as well. There's a little bit of, you know, there was one theory that it was a certain type of bacteria that was causing increased risk of obesity. We're sort of, you know, learning much more. It's much more complicated <laughs> than that, but that your gut microbiome will contribute to how many calories you take in, even driving how many calories you want to eat day to day based on what those bacteria, if they're in balance or out of balance. So the diet affecting obesity, the diet affecting dysbiosis, this increasing gut permeability, this leading to LPS being released, this also leading to decreased amount of short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are metabolites when we eat fiber in our diet, we make these short chain fatty acids, which help to regulate the immune system. They help to keep the T regulatory cells, which are your part of your immune response in check. And so if you have lower short chain fatty acids, you're having um, lower amount of T regulatory cells, you're kind of predisposed to having more of the inflammation and that leading to chemokines and cytokines and increasing the amount of pain and all of that leading to the low grade inflammation. 
here also with weight, we've always sort of traditionally thought, okay, well, osteoarthritis, you know, if you lose weight, you're going to feel better. It may not, it, you know, it's likely not just mechanical stress that here they're starting to say, okay, well, you've got the mechanical stress from being overweight, but the overweight is probably likely to the, due to the diet and the gut permeability and the dysbiosis, which is also contributing to the inflammation. So this is where really understanding that intricate system and how all of these things play to, together and how we can address multiple areas to help you with joint pain. Next pick. Thank you. So, um, so oftentimes the gut is the source and we need to look at that as being one of the things to understand and to um, address uh, right away. For most people, we wanna really make sure we're taking a close and deep look at gut inflammation. Next slide, please. So we do functional testing, looking at digestion, inflammation. We can check if you how much uh, of the short chain fatty acids you have. Um, we can look at if you have parasites, we can check for yeast. We can look for H. pylori, a bacteria that lives in the stomach that can predispose to ulcers and also to gastric cancer. And we look at all of these things through stool testing to really kind of get a deeper look as to what's happening for your body and also how well you digest your food so that you can get those micronutrients for energy. Um, one organism we'll look at a little bit later is this organism called acromensia, which is a very important one that lives in the mucin layer, the mucus layer of your gut. It helps to regulate that gut, um, that leaky gut propensity. So when you have a higher amount of acromensia, it sort of acts as a guard, keeps from having the leaky gut development as well. Next slide. Uh, so this looking again, it's sort of a, a review as to gut microbiome and osteoarthritis pain review of the literature and how does this connect together? Next slide, please. And so they were looking at um, Clostridia, which is a, a type of, of bacteria. There are certain subtypes of Clostridia. You might've heard of C. diff, which is Clostridium difficile, uh, which can cause a very strong infection and a pretty dangerous infection. But this, uh, there are other subtypes of Clostridium that live with our in our gut microbiome that don't cause any issues. Even C. diff for some people, they can have some of it in their gut, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a pathogen. It needs to kind of reach a critical level um, for, for some to, to cause issues. So this paper was looking at those two with some strep species, and they were looking at Clostridium that certain subtypes could increase THC, TH17 autoinflammation, where you have more propensity towards autoimmune conditions and strep, um, certain species of strep increasing macrophages and leading to inflammatory immune response. Um, and they were even looking and seeing in synovial fluid, when they took fluid out from the joints, they were seeing that there was lipopolysaccharide in the synovial fluid, indicating that this was coming from a leaky gut. Those bacterial um, components were in the joint and were causing issues. Next uh, slide, please. So both systemic and local LPS burden associated with knee osteoarthritis and uh, severity inflammation. Uh, again, this paper looking at different types of exposure to LPS. Next slide, please. Um, so this LPS tends to prime the joint macrophages. So part of your um, immune system response, this is your um, innate immune system kind of getting triggered when they see that lip lipopolysaccharide, they say, okay, this is not supposed to be here, you know, attack and then cause a cascade of inflammation. Um, coming from that. Next slide, please. So leaky gut, effective dietary fat, uh, fiber and fat on your microbiome and your intestinal barrier. You're seeing, of course, how important it is to have a healthy gut microbiome. Well, how do you do that? It's really boils down to kind of simple, simple procedure. Next, uh, next slide, please. It has a lot to do with what you eat. <laughs> so making sure that you're getting enough dietary fiber we usually like to recommend lots of different fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables, kind of eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, and eight of those really being vegetables, two of fruit, just so you don't increase too much sugar from the fruit. Low glycemic fruit like berries have a lot of anti-inflammatory component, but you want to get a variety of different things. So, you know, if you tend to be someone who tends to eat the same things every day, try to kind of, you know, include different vegetables that maybe you haven't tried before, look up different recipes, get those nutrients into your diet because they will help with your microbiome. Um, there are certain fibers from asparagus, jicama, leeks, artichokes, 
which have um, some insoluble fiber that actually feed the microbiome um, and increase the short chain fatty acids we were mentioning before. So those foods can really help you create a better and healthier and more robust, robust microbiome. Um, proteins and fats, you know, there's, you need protein to build muscle. Everybody is different on how much they need. And you want, again, get a variety depending on your kind of what your health history is. Usually wild fish are very safe for most people. So that'd be wild salmon, sardines, mackerel, herring, and anchovies, which have the highest amount of omega-3. So you, if including those into your diet and then good fats um, from avocados, nuts and seeds, um, coconut in small amounts can be very healthy for you as well. So you can see that what you eat affects your gut microbiome and both of those affect your intense intestinal barrier. So we have a lot of control of what we can do to optimize our health in this way. Next slide, please. So you're saying we should imagine that we're a pregnant mother who's eating for two, except for in this case, the two would be our human cells and then our bacterial cell uh, colony, so to speak. That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there's there's a, you know, a lot of debate of how much our, our intestine, our microbiome cells are driving, right? What, what you want to eat. So <laughs> yeah, when I read that, I would that changed my eating pattern because when I learned that bacteria were telling my brain to eat more sugar, I said, I'll be darned if I'm going to let some little bacteria tell me what to eat. So that's what it took for me to eat healthier. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, it's, it's really, it is incredible because what you eat will be reflected and then you'll crave sort of those types of foods a little bit more yep. um, than you might've before. And so, you know, it's a win-win when you go in the right direction and away from the, the sugar craving ones. Yep. Um, this slide is a little complicated, but it's mostly just to kind of talk about that leaky gut again, and then um, to emphasize about um, the uh, acromensia, mucinophilia organism that lives here in this gut lining. So it really acts as a guard, and it helps us to keep that gut lining healthy. And then when, as you're kind of eating those um, fibers we were talking about, these are the three short chain fatty acids we know of so far. Butyrate has kind of gotten the headlines quite a bit because it has a strong connection with the brain and keeping our brain healthy. Um, so those foods I mentioned about um, leeks, jicama, asparagus, artichoke, which are a small group of what, what are the, the foods that have the prebiotic fibers, but they help this these um, short chain fatty acids to increase. Next slide, please. Um, so this it was another paper talking about uh, acromancy and mucinophilia with host-derived substances and bacteria and what you eat. Next slide, please. And so it's, again, is you know, living in there, help, helping to keep that healthy gut barrier. It has been associated with metabolic health. So there's an association if your acromancia is lower, you may be more prone towards diabetes. You may be more prone to cardiovascular health and immune um, issues as well. There, with the stool testing we do, we do measure acromensia. And usually there is um, one probiotic that has been made to try to build up the amount of acromensia. This is a tough organism to kind of get in the right place because it lives in a very kind of hostile environment. So it's hard to take an oral pill to get there. So we usually will try a lot with food um, to get your body to kind of get that um, organism to increase in, in uh, number. Next slide, please. So here, just another kind of um, discussion about where this acromensia is and how it really helps to keep the intestinal um, epithelial cells nice and healthy. Um, melatonin has been shown to increase hmm. acromensia. So sleep and regular circadian sleep is really important. We produce melatonin naturally, usually around 10 p.m. for most people. So trying to wind down and not stay too up too late and not be, you know, um, having these bright lights that we can be exposed to at night, which will decrease the amount of melatonin from the pineal gland. Um, and then trying to get a good night's sleep, which for a lot of people I know can be a struggle. Um, but, you know, again, working with a doctor to help you with natural ways to get a good night's sleep, wind down, make sure you have your circadian clock set in the morning by getting out in the sunlight. Um, and we're lucky in San Diego, we usually get a good amount of sunlight. It looks like we have some now, but um, just to, to help us with our circadian clock. Next slide, please. These are some other foods that have been found to increase the amount of um, acromensia. 
um, polyphenols and flavonoids you get mostly from um, fruits and vegetables, uh, diff different colors of fruits and vegetables. Uh, camo camo is a um, plant that also has high amounts of vitamin C. It also can increase necromancia, white beans as well. And then bile acids, which are produced in your gallbladder and released into your small intestine to help you digest fats, has also been shown to help um, support acromancia. Ketogenic diet um, has some benefit. I'm not a huge fan of doing too much on the ketogenic diet because most people do a lot of saturated fats, which may or may not be good for you, um, especially long-term. So, so that can be a plus or minus, maybe a short-term type of, of program. Um, and then, you know, a, a few other things with the capsaicin, hot pepper, rhubarb has some benefit as well. And inulin is a um, prebiotic fiber, which we talked about with those foods that we were, I was mentioning earlier. Next slide, please. This is just another discussion about acromensia. I like this uh, paper, next slide please, Mary, because it shows the relationships. So we talked about systems biology at the beginning and how things are interconnected. Here's acromensia and how it's connected to your glucose metabolism, your insulin levels, your liver is over here, it's connected as well. Um, your cholesterol is over here how much fat you carry in your around your hips versus around your abdomen, um, your waist hip ratio, your age will develop, you know, is kind of combined with what's happening with fat deposition. And all of these are linked back to acromensia. So you can see how really interconnected, you know, they're taking from one organism. It's touching on three different organ systems, your liver, your heart, and your um, really in your, your gut and your, and your blood sugar control from the pancreas. Um, and it, it's all, it's all connected. So it's a nice diagram just to kind of bring all of those pieces together. Next slide, please. Um, so sex steroids, we talked about, uh, how hormones are important. They also are important for maintaining your joint health. Next slide, please. So this was a paper just looking at, you know, how do estrogen and testosterone and dihydrotestosterone affect different areas of, uh, of the joints, O oh, and DHEA, which is another anabolic hormone. It's a precursor to testosterone. We see some effects, you know, er, this will differ between men and women on this graph. They didn't make a distinction on that, but they did have another graph that sort of broke it down versus men versus women. But, um, you know, hormones will affect how well your joints are working. They kind of, they're helping to keep that area fluid and helping you to keep a good amount of anabolic uh, strength in the around the joint. So it's an important part of keeping your hormones well balanced for you and really physiologically for you. You don't want to kind of overdo on too much hormones either. Next slide, please. So we look at your hormones in your blood. We look at how well you metabolize your hormones. We can check this through the urine and look at the metabolites in the urine to say, okay, are you breaking down and making sure you're getting kind of the, the optimal breakdown of hormones? Um, so for example, estrogen has a few different pathways that can be broken down. One can be higher risk for breast cancer. Others can be very well metabolized. And we can sort of push the arrow, arrow a little bit to make the better form of estrogen um, using B vitamins and diet to help you really metabolize that into the proper form and then excrete it out through the gut. Um, and then using your history of hormones and your family history, we can really personalize a hormone protocol for men as well. You, you know, when you're doing hormones, we have to be careful that we're not pushing anything that could increase risk for prostate cancer. There are lots of ways to monitor that and follow it as well. Next page, please. Um, we talked about stress a little briefly. This was a, a nice kind of, re, you know, short review talking about the autonomic nervous system. So autonomic being your vagus nerve and um, the majority of what the vagus nerve is, is re representing is the autonomic nervous system and making sure that we're staying in balance. So we have that sympathetic fight or flight, parasympathetic, the rest and digest. Sympathetic, um, you know, is going to come out with the cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. It's kind of the drive and go, go, go. Parasympathetic, rest, breathe, relax. And, um, you know, we spend most of our day in the go, 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 and very little in the kind of rest and relax and recovery phase. So this paper looking at, well, how does that um, 
associate with pain. Next slide, please. And so really the paper was emphasizing the fact that we really should be using more of the vagus nerve specific exercises um, to help people engage that parasympathetic nervous system because it will downregulate some of the pain receptors and pain threshold and help our body to um, find a better balance. It also allows for recovery, really. Um, you know, if we talk about good sleep, you need to be in a parasympathetic mode to get that deep sleep. And when you sleep, you clean out a lot of inflammation from the body and the brain. So mindfulness-based meditation, breath work, visualization, there are even now vagus nerve stimulators you can use that help to kind of get the vagus nerve on balance. And if you have a history of PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, there are um, stellate ganglion blocks where they actually inject around the vagus nerve to try to get your body to be in a more parasympathetic balance so that your body can allow for healing and you're not kind of perpetually running on a high, high load of sympathetic drive. Next slide. Um, this was looking, I wanted to pull a little bit of some papers around heavy metals. So heavy metals, we can expo get exposed through food, through water, and through air. Um, and this paper was looking at um, cadmium concentrations. So this was coming from kind of exhaust that was in the air. And they saw, next slide, please, that um, those uh, people who had a higher level of cadmium, there was a much higher rate of rheumatoid arthritis developing for those patients. Um, and so they were really trying to look, and it was more prevalent in women than in men that who were exposed to cadmium. If the women were exposed, they had a higher rate of rheumatoid arthritis being developed. You know, we see that heavy metal exposure, lead exposure, you know, you've heard of lead exposure being from either water or from paint or other things that um, can cause problems from, um, from our brain health perspective, mercury used to be in our silver fillings. If you still have silver fillings, those are important to assess. We usually recommend a biological dentist to take a look at those because those, the, um, the uh, off, off um, part from the mercury that comes out can induce different types of immune dysregulation and cause problems systemically as well. So, and then mercury from fish is another big one. Um, so tuna tends to be higher mercury containing because it's a larger fish, sort of fish, the same sort of thing. So making sure that we're really optimizing what we're exposed to. And then if we are exposed to something, helping your body detoxify, like we talked about earlier. So that's drinking really good, healthy water, um, filtering your air and um, making sure you're eating enough fiber because the fiber will bind and you'll get rid of that through the stool. Sauna is great too. Sauna is probably one of the best to just sweat those things out of your system as well. Next slide, please. So testing I talked about for heavy metals, focusing on sweating, healthy bowel movements, um, walking and gentle rebounding can also be good because it's great for the lymph lymphatics and your lymphatic system helps you get rid of things from your, from your system as well. And then if we, we do see high levels, if we find that either in the blood or in the urine, we use supplements to bind those heavy metals and really try to help your body to clear them out. So we just give your body a little boost by um, using the supplements and binders. Next slide, please. So really optimizing your joint health. Um, you know, this is a lot of science that comes down to really simple interventions uh, that I hope would be easy to implement into your day-to-day -day life. Um, for your gut, eating a variety of fiber and prebiotic fibers and having those colorful foods. So we get the polyphenols, we increase the acromancia, um, and then you also increase your short chain fatty acids. Sleep, having circadian rhythm so that you're getting the melatonin production, the right balance. It helps to keep your hormones um, in balance as well. And it helps with detoxifications, deto detoxification systems when you have that sleep the lymphatic system of the brain called the glymphatic system cleans out the rest of your lymphatic system has time to clean out things that you've been exposed to. Optimizing your environment, just being careful about toxic exposures. So thinking about the cleaners that you have and you use in your home, 
the you know, makeup products that, that uh, women use, oftentimes you can now get some very nice clean products. If you wanted to check that out, the environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg.org is a great resource. They break down, test all of these different things and tell you and give you the score, what's beneficial and what's not so beneficial. Making sure you sweat with exercise, which is important for everything. Um, sauna use as well. Meditating and having some time for your autonomic nervous system to rest so that you can have the recovery and optimizing hormones through checking and really seeing if you need some extra help. And this doesn't mean you have to take hormones, but it, you may just optimize your lifestyle to help your hormones function at the best possible level. So yes, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. That's yeah. a lot of great information. <laughs> well, it shows you how complicated we are as human beings and why it takes a thoughtful physician like Dr. Mona to help us through this process. You know, those of us in the orthopedic world for so long think of bones and muscles and joints as just, you know, hinges and pulleys and, you know, just this mechanical system, but at its core, it's biologic, just like everything else in the body. And that's what attracted us to you was your, your knowledge of how to optimize, you know, what you say at the core roots, you know, what systems may be out of balance that would help feed forward and support uh, health and orthopedics, but then also other areas of a patient's life. So thank you for running us through that. Um, and, right. Uh, I mean, for me too, the take home message, Chris, is, is all the things that we know we should do you know, but do not do, I mean, you know how hard it is to just get, you know, sleep, nutrition, exercise, but that's why we have, you know, physicians like you, Dr. Velinov, that kind of will push us in the right direction and, you know, tell us like what to do and what not to do. Um, so that's great. That's a lot of great information. I'll also share one more thing. Um, and that is um, when I had my own orthopedic injury a few years ago, uh, Dr. Mona helped me. Uh, I, I understood that um, I was in a bad way and needed to optimize some things in addition to the traditional physical therapy and the injections that Dr. Ambach was doing for my neck, the things that we offer our patients here. I realized that other aspects needed to be addressed. So thank you for that. It has made a huge difference in my personal health, which is why I want your message to get out to more people uh, to understand that it's one thing to tell a patient, you know, eat a rainbow, get to bed on time, uh, drink lots of water, all these things, exercise, right? But so many of us are stuck in these little loops that there's another way out of them, whether it's optimizing the gut uh, microbiome or, if, or specifically identifying what part of the gut microbiome needs to be tweaked to make it function better. And it's your approach to evidence-based medicine as opposed to just general statements that we hear so often in the media or on the internet, your, your very uh, evidence-based approach that I think makes you so effective as a physician. We strive to do the same thing here, where we use the available scientific evidence to guide our decision-making with patients on a customized basis. Yeah, no, great, wonderful. So we're looking at the questions. We've got about seven minutes to do questions. Um, and I get this a lot from my patients, metformin. What do you think about there? There's a lot of news recently about metformin and its anti-aging properties, supporting longevity, you know, its cardioprotective effects, prevention of cancer, lots of information about metformin recently. What do you think about that? Yeah, so there's an ongoing study right now near Barzilai out of New York, who's doing the TAME study looking at targeting uh, aging with metformin. So I think we'll know a lot more about it. It has pros and cons uh, to it. I mean, it's a drug that's been around for a long time. It's found to be relatively safe. The problem can be, it can lead to diarrhea for some patients. It can also cause B12 deficiency. So you have to be really vigilant on being careful that you supplement those things that we, you know, you're monitored uh, with time over that. Um, there are some other things that I use that are herbal that don't have those type of effects. Like for example, berberine is usually pretty well tolerated with uh, most people. Um, and it's a great, it, it works for your cholesterol. It helps with blood sugar. It's good for your gut. And, um, so those are some things that I'll look kind of on an individual basis. If you have a strong family history for diabetes and you're kind of in that pre-diabetic 
pathway, sometimes a short course of metformin to kind of get some things back in balance while you're working on lifestyle uh, factors can be helpful. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out more from the studies if it's, if it's really kind of the, the best thing to do for longevity. Right. Thank you for that. Um, there, there's a lot of things that you hear and, you know, it, it's good to always uh, go back to the evidence before um, engaging in the practice. I think the interesting thing that I'd heard or read was that all the researchers who studied metformin or many of them were taking metformin, whereas a lot of the researchers who study ketogenic diet are not on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was yeah. pretty tell, two pretty telling pieces of information. Right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, there's a question here about BMF, uh, which for some of you who don't know, oh, it's see, electromagnetic yeah. field um, therapy in conjunction with other modalities. Yeah, um, It creates, it delivers this um, magnetic um, field to um, actually get into the cell level uh, to increase um, mitochondrial processes. It helps with healing. It helps decrease inflammation, helps with pain. Um, and it used to be that this is a treatment that you can only only get in doctor's clinic, but now there's actually devices that you can bring home um, so that you can use it at your own leisure. Uh, but there has been good evidence with it. In fact, we recommend it to some of our patients um, as an adjunct to the treatments that we do. Yeah, I think like a lot of the therapies that we're talking about here, they're, they're generally have very good safety profiles, right? So PEMF, pulse electromagnetic field, uh, good studies showing safety in orthopedic applications for pain, reducing pain, improving local circulation to the tissues. Um, the challenges that remain, just like so many things in medicine these days, what's the appropriate dose? How long do you use it? How frequently do you use it? Who, you know, who are the best candidates to use it? So those, those are still being explored, but like you said, they're, they're relatively inexpensive devices that you can now purchase uh, uh, that can be used uh, for um, a variety of aches and pains that patients have. And we find that it works better for some conditions than others. Um, we're actually, I actually have a, a company that ha uh, maintains a database. So patients that are using these devices are tracking their outcomes. So we'll, we'll learn more in the future. Dr. Bellino, for our um audience that do not know much about your specialty. Can you just describe us what and explain to us what is integrative medicine, functional medicine, and longevity medicine, and how they differ or uh, supplement each other? Yeah, I would say they supplement one another. Mary, integrative medicine is a little bit more to do with um, herbal treatments and um, a lot of focus on mind-body um, practices. Functional medicine is a lot of biochemistry, so it's a lot of the pathways I was mentioning of, you know, get, digging deep into what's the cellular pathway and the biochemistry that's happening and what's from a biochemistry pathway is out of balance that needs to be corrected. So we use that on top of the mind-body techniques. And then longevity medicine is really thinking, okay, I'm seeing you here now at your age, what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years from now and let's start planning and doing things now that will help you in 30 years. So it's a more of a kind of a long-term thinking of like, okay, you want to be skiing when you're 60, then let's do these things now. If you want to be hiking when you're 80, these are the things we need to do, do now to get, get you in shape to stay in, in that place so that you can do those things when you get older and you can have that robust resilience. So uh, a lot of the, the treatments that we do are also involved in healing injuries. And one of the questions that we always get is how can I optimize my body so that I can respond better to the PRP therapy or to the cell therapies that you are providing? And I yeah. think all the things that you have just talked about, Dr. Velenov, are just you know, all the important things that um, need to be considered for the bodies to heal better, respond more appropriately to the treatment. Yeah, there was actually a study where they had um, older patients and they gave them different sleep cycles and then gave them all an immunization of vaccine. Mm -hmm. And those who were not sleeping had a much lower response to the vaccine than those who had a regular sleep cycle had a very nice res response to the, the vaccination um, from that. So we can see like, you know, just 
getting good sleep on a regular basis as much as you can will help when you come in for a therapy to get the better cellular response. But then if you add on top of that, you know, okay, let's do some stress management. Let's make sure that you're eating these foods before and after, you know, then you can continue to stack on top of one another um, and really kind of get a compound response. To, um, so to be uh, mindful of uh, people's time, we will take this last question. Uh, you, you gave us a lot of evidence with regards to joint health. Is there anything specific in the um, studies about ligament health or tendon health that was different or the same uh, with regards to optimizing outcomes and this general systems approach in um, treating the body? Yeah. I didn't get too much into kind of musculoskeletal with you know posture and core strength and what do we do for helping um, kind of from a structural standpoint. So I often do a DEXA scan for, for patients and look at both their bone density plus where they're carrying extra weight. So if you have a higher visceral fat, which can be changing how you're moving through the day um, and how you sit then that would be something from a metabolic standpoint is important because higher visceral fat increases risk for inflammation of heart disease and, and increases your risk for diabetes, but also changes how you move. So sometimes using some of these other studies to really sort of hone in on how do we keep your, your um, ligaments and tendons as healthy as possible uh, will be important. We, I just had a patient who has two rotator cuffs that are torn. So he was, you know, I had him working with a, a team looking at, well, what's your mobility, what's happening? And he's got a forward neck that's just pushing and pulling up <laughs> all of that. And then, you know, with his exercise activities, he was, he ended up having these torn rotator cuffs because of his posture and how he's moving. So now he's working to really get his neck in alignment and move all of those things through. And then I work with him as helping with inflammation internally. Um, you know, there's different ways we can test for things like NAD and I didn't get into all the NAD and NMN. There's a whole other subset of things that you can do to help facilitate some of that healing as well. And that can be a personalized part of what you would need to, um, to optimize. Well, we will have to have you come back and speak at some point in the future <laughs> because uh, as we were commenting earlier, this field is just moving at lightning pace and things that we didn't really know even a few years ago now are becoming very well studied, very, very robust data showing us what we should and should not be doing to maintain the balance within our body. Yeah, I, I chuckle a little bit. You're talking about um, you know, balance of our gut um, uh, function, you know, metabolic function, but also in orthopedics, we talk about muscle balance, you know, how well, you know, you're talking about posture and how the muscles in the back have to balance with the muscles in the front so that your posture is pro appropriate. So, you know, as we all know, it all comes down to balance, but we need to first help the patient identify, are you leaning this way? Or are you leaning this way? Is your gut doing this or is it doing this? And then we can push everything back to that middle balance point. I think that's really what um, you uh, offer and appreciate you for doing the work you do uh, for the personal help you provided me and for our patients. And we will definitely have you back in the future. Thank Absolutely. You. We appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for you. those of you that have not um, seen the, all of the lecture, we will be having a copy of this um, webinar in our YouTube channel, San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group. And Dr. Mona has her information in there in, in, in case you wanted to reach her, get in touch with her, have her evaluate you. Thank you so much, Mona, for joining Thank us you. this afternoon. Thank Thanks, Dr. Thank Rogers, for Bye. being here. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye.